So good afternoon, everybody. I hope uh, that you are able to hear me okay. And uh, we're starting module one. So uh, our previous presentation on Friday was a quick overview and an introduction to the whole topic of rheology and um, kind of the commercial aspects of rheology. And this one is going to be three parts. So I will, this is introduction to rheology and rheological testing. So some of this will be a repeat of what you heard on Friday. Um, we're, we're split up into three modules. So module one is part A, how rheology works, uh, theory. And then uh, part B will be geometry choice and cartridges. And then part C will be an instrument overview and the Connexus accessories. So, um, as you may remember from Friday, what is the word rheology? Well, it's derived from two words, which is rios and logos. Rios is stream current or river or flowing, and logos is the study of something. So you could say it's the study of rivers or the study of flowing. And um, we call it now the science of deformation and flow. That's a good definition, actually and we'll be describing both deformation and flow. So obviously this is really used in practical terms to solve problems. My material doesn't pour, or it's not stable, doesn't spray very well, it seems to um, not be atomizing nicely, or maybe it's sediments, uh, or leaving trail marks even if you're printing it, you know? So uh, these different things you can describe um, with rheology, and we're gonna look at both the deformation where you just probe the structure of a sample without destroying it, and the flow, that's the viscometry of the sample. So firstly, deformation. This quantifies the viscoelasticity of a sample. And um, if you're doing oscillation on a sample, you can see how it's going to behave before it flows. Maybe the resistance to flow, or the viscoelastic structure of the sample before it starts flowing. And that would tell you, is it likely to sediment? Is it likely to sag? That sort of thing. And so we can do these tests with oscillation or relaxation or creep. And, um, and then flow itself, which is mainly viscosity testing. And so this would show you how it's gonna pump, how can it be sprayed, anything where you know the material is actually flowing. So um, quick overview again, that's kind of a recap of what we did on Friday. Obviously, we've got the, uh, we're gonna have a few uh, variables here, the stress, the strain, and the shear strain rate um, of the material, which we'll define in a minute. The sample is sandwiched between two surfaces of a geometry. So maybe in a plate, plate situation, you'd have two, um, let me use a laser pointer here. You'd have a lower plate, which is stationary during the test, and an upper plate, which is gonna rotate, and the sample is sandwiched in between them. And this will then be able to rotate and exert a shear rate and a shear stress on the sample. And obviously, if you apply the shear rate, you measure the shear stress. And if you apply the shear stress, you can measure the resultant shear rate. So um, we can calculate then the viscosity, which is shear stress divided by shear rate, or sigma over gamma dot, and or the modulus. If you're doing an oscillation experiment, you can look at the shear stress required divided by the shear strain. You notice that doesn't have a dot on it, so that's just gamma. It's the strain, or if it's integrated with time, then obviously it's the shear rate, so that has a dot on it. So again, the basic principles of measurement are that the, um, the rheometer is going to have an air, uh, a motor at the top, which is able to apply torque or stress onto the sample. Obviously, uh, torque is generic rotary force, and then stress is the force per unit area. And then there's an air bearing, which is very low friction, and that allows this rotor to spin freely without much friction on it. And uh, then we're gonna measure how fast it rotates with this position sensor. And um, from the shear rate and the shear stress, which was applied, we can see the viscosity of the sample. And um, obviously we have a geometry recognition system and a chuck, that's number four. And then the geometry itself, the upper one is number five. And we're gonna have to obviously set the gap 
and the normal force. We can measure the up and down force with strain gauges here. And then we have the temperature controller at the bottom, that's number seven, which does not move. Okay, so in viscometry, we're rotating the upper plate round and around, and hopefully the sample will flow in a laminar way. So that's like a pack of cards. So you have this uh, force on the upper plate, F, and the sample may be displaced U, and obviously it has a height, we're gonna call it D in this case. So that's the gap between the plates. In oscillation, you're going to oscillate just a little bit to the right and then to the left and then to the right and to the left and then repetitively we're probing the structure but we're not destroying it. So this would be analogous to DMA where you're oscillating the sample but in this case it's just um, rotating left and right a little bit between the two plates so it could be a liquid even here. So if you take a, um, a cube of this sample, if we go back to here and we, we take this sample here we cut a little cube of it out, and we say, well, how is that actually moving? Then you could describe it like this. So we're applying a force across the top surface, and obviously if that surface was big, then it would be a very small stress. So the size of the area over which the force is applied is critical. So the force divided by the area gives you the shear stress. And so <clears throat> that's in pascals, that's the SI unit, it's pascals or newtons per square meter. And then the sample may or may not flow. So if it's, a, if it's a piece of rubber or something and you pull on it and it just deforms a little bit, this should be U here, um, or, and it's got M here, in, obviously the units are meters, um, and the height of the sample would be in meters, obviously a very small number of meters, like a millimeter or something like that, but you're just displacing it and dividing it by the height, and that gives you the shear strain. And this is dimensionless because meters divided by meters cancel out, so there are no units there for strain. And um, now if the sample is a liquid, obviously, instead of just deforming and stopping, it continues to flow, and so you get a change in strain every second. So in this case, let's say the sample deformed half of its height every second. So this was one millimeter and it moves half a millimeter. Then we have a change in strain. It is, sorry, this is 0.5 divided by one. So we have a strain of 0.5. And if it be every second, this would be 0.5 divided by one second. So we have a shear strain rate of 0 0.5. And then we're dividing it by time, so it's a reciprocal seconds. We call it reciprocal seconds, one over s. So the number of strains that the sample has experienced in a second. So the strains per second is reciprocal seconds, and we have this uh, the symbol gamma dot. So d gamma by dt. So shear rate is just a good way of describing the flow behavior, but by strain. So it takes account of the gap as well. So in this module, we're going to have a quick look about the ideas of rheology, how it works, as we did, and, um, and what geometries we'll be looking at next, and which cartridges. So very quick overview there of the definitions of shear stress and shear strain and how the rheometer worked. And this is going to be a lot quicker than my presentations last week, uh, so uh, hopefully you'll be glad about that. Okay, so um, part B of module one is um, we're going to discuss the different measuring systems. So there are different types, parallel plates, cones and plates, and cups and bobs, and then obviously different cartridges as well. And so we can see um, which geometries are most appropriate. Now, obviously, the most sensitive thing on the instrument, one of the most important things is which geometry you're going to use when you do a test. And if you use the wrong one, um, it, it's not necessarily fatal, but it can be hampering the results. It can be tough to get the right results if you're using the wrong measuring system. So um, we're going to go through the pros and cons of each type of measuring system and hopefully give you some background information so that if you have to do rheology testing, you'll be able to advise a customer well, or you'll be able to do it with the right measuring systems. 
So there are quite a lot of different cones and plates. And um, generically, we say for a thicker sample, we need a smaller measuring system because we've only got a finite torque range. And if the sample is really stiff, a piece of polymer or a piece of rubber or very stiff um, dispersion like Play-Doh or something, then you have to use that stress on a very small area, that torque rather, on a very small area. And so um, that gives us pretty high stress. So a small plate like a parallel plate 20 would work fine for Play-Doh or something like that. But if we have a low viscosity sample, like water or milk or uh, cream or something like that, well, then we'd use a larger surface area so we can spread that torque over a bigger surface. And we have here parallel plate 50 or parallel plate 60. And um, so with these different measuring systems, actually you can measure almost any type of sample. And the instruments have gotten more and more sensitive now such that you can even measure low viscosity liquids with a small plate if you had to. But if you want to stick within the range of the instrument easily, then it's better to use a big plate for low viscosity and a small plate for high viscosity stuff. Okay, so there's lots of uh, different types. As I've said, the parallel plate, generally said to be good for oscillation because um, it, it doesn't uh, shear the sample uniformly across the whole surface, but in oscillation, you're working within the linear viscoelastic region, so that's okay. But you have flexibility of the gap with a plate, so you can clamp any sample. Um, we, we have cones and plates, which are great for viscometry because they give you an absolute shear rate, constant shear rate across the gap. And then the cup and bob, these are good for low viscosity samples where the sample um, can really be sensed very, very well with a large surface area or if you have very volatile samples. So this will stop them evaporating if they're held in a cup. So let's look at the pros and cons of each of these. So for a simple set of flat plates, the advantages, the pros are that it's easy to clean. You just wipe it off. You can open up the gap, get a tissue, wipe the sample off, maybe squirt it with some water. So these are stainless steel plates. We don't have to be afraid of them. And the instrument's not overly delicate that we'd need to be afraid of cleaning it. So we can just wipe these plates off. Unless the sample's really glued on the upper plate, then you can wipe the upper plate as well as the lower one. And we can use a variable gap here. Now, as you remember, a narrower gap would give you a higher shear rate, right? Because it's the displacement divided by the gap. Now, if we use a very narrow gap, then we can get to very high shear rates, actually. So this is great for simulating spraying and things like that. The disadvantage, obviously, of plates are that the range of shear across the surface is dependent on, on where you are in the plate. So in the center, the sample is just twisting. But at the perimeter, the sample is getting quite a lot of shearing. See, so um, you could say there's a range of shears being experienced by the sample. And it's giving you a little bit of an averaging effect across that surface. So um, so what we do is we take the average, uh, which is at three quarters of the radius. And um, there were some guys that showed that actually if you measure at three quarters of the radius, you get more or less the right result for most tests. So, so we can be um, safely using parallel plates to know that we're getting the right result. Um, if you have evaporating samples, then they tend to form a skin at the rim here. You know, let's say you put a paint on there. And it doesn't take very long for the water to, to evaporate. You get a little skin forming. And because this is around the perimeter of the plate, it can really dominate the measurement, especially if you're looking at yield stress or something like startup stresses and things like that. So it's a good idea to uh, cover it up with a solvent trap if you're going to do that, or maybe to use a cup and bob instead. Now, um, this is what I was saying. The 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 perimeter of the plate is getting the most shear, but the center is getting just torsional testing, basically. It's just twisting on the spot. And um, so that's a disadvantage, <clears throat> but we all measure at three quarters. So if this was happening on the instrument, it would say seven and a half reciprocal seconds on the screen for shear rate. Now, if you go really, really quickly, the sample tends to get thrown out a little bit by radial forces. So this is obviously rotating and the sample has uh, 
centrifugal force so it gets thrown out and it obviously can't break free because of its surface tension so it tends to go into this turbulent flow and um, this isn't drawn correctly but it should be turbulent outwards here as well and so it can give you an artifact of elevated viscosities and go to very high shear rates with a big gap and so the way to get around that would be to use a very narrow gap um, yeah so some people would then use a a gap of maybe 0.5 or 0.2 or even 0.02 millimeters and that way you don't really have room for turbulent flow to occur you're going to clamp it and it's going to be in laminar flow even at narrow gaps so obviously when you load the geometry onto the instrument you need to zero the gap and that would mean that the instrument needs to come down until the plates touch together and that presses with 10 newtons of force and then it backs off just a little bit to say, hey, we're just touching now, and that's the zero position. So, um, as I mentioned, you can use a solvent trap to cover the sample up and stops it evaporating, um, which is very effective, actually. And um, we would have this abbreviated name. So, as I kind of mentioned, we've got PP20 for parallel plate, or you could see CP for cone and plate. So cones and plates, now these are similar in that they're great for wiping off. You just wipe it with a tissue and it gives you absolute viscosity results. And the narrower the cone angle, the higher the shear rate you get. So if you think about it, the narrower the cone angle here is uh, like changing up a gear on a bicycle. As you go to a half a degree cone, you're going to have twice the shear rate of a one degree cone which would have twice the shear rate of a two degree cone. So the cone angle is actually proportional to the shear rate that you get, um, obviously multiplied by the rotational speed. So um, easy to clean the plates, easy to get uh, a constant shear rate across the sample because it's a cone and the different cone angles will give you different gearing, if you like, different shear rate ranges. This advantage, obviously, is that the sample's got a narrow gap at the apex. Now, this is exaggerated, so the, this truncation isn't nearly so big. It's usually about 1% of the area of that cone, but it does have a little flat on the top of it. And the reason for that is so that when you zero the gap and back it off, there is a gap there. It's not just touching at the center. And... Um, and if there was any thermal expansion, it's not going to grind metal against metal, you see. So um, better to have some gap than none at all. And um, we can get higher viscosity results with a narrower gap. Maybe um, this could handle samples a little bit better if they come out of a cone of a parallel plate. You can sometimes get away with a cone and plate. So um, as I mentioned, this gives you a constant shear rate across the sample and um let's see here yep we have um 10 reciprocal seconds so normally with a plate as the gap increases the shear rate would decrease but obviously with a with a plate as well as you go to a wider radius you're going to get a, a wider shear rate because you're further from the center and so these two effects actually counteract one another and we'll get a constant shear rate across the whole sample so at the edge let's say we're doing 10 reciprocal seconds but half the radius we've got half the gap and so you still have 10 and a quarter of the radius you have a quarter of the gap and this truncation would be a very small area where the where the shear rate might not be perfect but actually the whole sample apart from that bit in the middle is going to give you the right shear rate depending on the rotational speed so um, that's how cones are working and to use this, they actually have to be zeroed, and then it would have to be in the position that it would be touching the bottom if it was there. So this is a virtual tip truncation. We cut it off, and then the gap would be opened up to the right amount after we've loaded a sample, we'd close down just to the right gap there and trim it off, such that if there was a tip, it would just be touching. Okay, so... Um, you obviously have a, a narrow gap at the very tip here. So this advantage is if you have big particles, you can get jamming at the apex. So um, the, the rule of thumb is that the gap here at the center should be at least 10 times the average particle size. 
And um, if you know then your particles are 10 microns, you really should be going for a 100 micron or larger gap in the center of this cone. Otherwise, you could get jamming or, or noisy data. And so um, just so that you know what the gaps usually are, it depends on the cone angle. <clears throat> so for a four degree cone, we have a 150 micron gap at the apex. For a two degree cone, we have a 70 micron gap at the apex. And for a one degree, we have a 30 micron cone. So obviously we have to zero the plate or the cone on the plate, and then we load the sample, and we can use the solvent trap to stop it drying out. We're gonna talk a bit about that more in the next module. And the, the abbreviations here are CP, a four slash 40, we mean we've got a four degree cone, 40 millimeters in diameter, and it's a cone and plate. So cups and bobs. This is a coaxial cylinders, also known as couette, after the French gentleman. And the sample here is um, lowered, in, is poured into that cup, and then we're going to immerse the bob down into it. And that's gonna be completely dipped into the sample like this. And we actually have a deep gap at the bottom. So the shearing at the bottom is quite small, but the amount of shear done on the sides of this bob is much larger. So most of the measurement is done on the sides of the bob, which means that zeroing the gap isn't critical here, um, not like with a plate or a cone. So there's some advantages. Um, you get less evaporation, the sample is all enclosed. And even if the sample does evaporate, and forms the skin here, it's not actually where the main measuring surfaces are. The measuring surfaces are immersed under the surface of the liquid. So it doesn't really matter too much if it skins over. You've got a fairly wide gap, so one to one and a half millimeters all around this cup and bob system. So it can allow for larger particles if you like. And you've got more surface area. So this is great for low viscosity liquids. The um, the disadvantages, obviously, the, the sample has to be cleaned out of a cup. So if you have tar or something like this, maybe not so easy to handle. So you'd want to use it for liquids, maybe. And if you want to do oscillation, obviously, you're going to rotate this big bob backwards and forwards, and it's got more inertia, so that can affect your data a little bit. And um, I guess if you use a narrowish gap, then the end effect, as we call it, that the effect of stress on the bottom of the bob could, could be a problem. Um, not usually an issue here, but somebody's noted here that it could be a problem. Now, the most sensitive geometry is called a double gap cell, and we have double surfaces. So this is actually a hollow cylinder that we're dipping into an annulus, and it works very well by measuring both the outside of that cylinder and the inside surfaces. So we've got almost like double the surface area of a cup and bob geometry. Um, <clears throat> The advantages are obviously it's a hollow thing, so it has very low inertia and it has a high surface area, so you can measure very low viscosity liquids. So if you want the most sensitivity, this is the best geometry to use. The disadvantages obviously are you still have a wide gap, relatively wide gap, so you can get turbulence if you're measuring these very low viscosity liquids. The sample can go into these Taylor vortices. As, as drawn on the picture here. And um, the other downside, obviously, it, it takes five to six milliliters here, and it's a little bit tough to clean the sample out if it's a sticky, thick liquid. So you'd normally only use a double gap cell for very low viscosity materials. There's a few other special geometries. Um, so some of these particularly are good to stop slip on the sample. So if you have, um, a, a sample of a, a gel, like maybe bentonite or something like this, or a mineral like that, and a mineral gel or a thick paint or yogurt, and you really want to test this gelatinous structure, you could form that gel in a cup and leave it. it might take a while to build, and then load that into the instrument and then cut vertically into it with a vein tool. So what this will do, it will actually cut in without destroying all the sample structure and then you can start the test to rotate. You get a quarter of a turn, obviously, before the sample is a bit disrupted. But if you want to see the startup stress that's required, then a vein tool is actually a great tool because you can have lots of cups pre-prepared with different samples in, put them in the instrument, cut vertically into it, 
and then measure the startup stress. If you know that you have a sample that's likely to slip, then you want to use a roughened or serrated plate surface. So the way to check if a plate, if the sample is going to slip, would be to to maybe get a piece of metal or a piece of glass and squirt some of the sample onto it, and then tap it vertically on this side on a desk. And if that sample seems to slide down, leaving a snail trail behind it, then you could see, oh yes, it's going to slip. You can see it slipping as a lump rather than just spreading out uniformly on the geometry on this piece of glass or piece of metal. So it's likely to do the same in the instrument. And so by using a roughened or serrated plate surface, we can grip the sample's body without allowing it to slip. So here's some um, results measured with a smooth plate and with a serrated plate. You can see the smooth plate uh, results here. Um, they start off with the right, right viscosity, so we're getting the right result here. And then above a certain stress, we start to form a slip plane. So now you see what's happening is that the sample is forming maybe a, a liquid at one surface and at the other surface, and it's starting to slip around. And so you get an incredibly low viscosity. It's obviously artificially low because you're only measuring the slip of this sample rather than the whole of its flow. And then when you go fast enough, obviously the slip plane gets thicker and thicker until it mixes right in and the results get correct again. But if you measure with a, a serrated surface, then the samples actually get gripped into it. And if they do liquefy or if there's any phase separation, then hopefully the void volume of this surface is large enough to capture the water. And so we get laminar flow between the plates. Now, when we zero the uh, serrated plates, it touches the, the peaks against the peaks. And so the effective sample volume is just peak to peak here. And the sample would not be expected to flow in and out of each serration. But that can give you the correct results. So how do you know if you need to measure with smooth plates or serrated plates? Well, firstly, you could check by knocking the sample, as it were, on a piece of metal on its side and see if it looks like it's going to slip. Or you could actually try a roughened and a smooth and then roughened plates. And if the results are the same shape, that would indicate that it's not slipping. But if, they, if they're completely different shape, like these results are different shape, this indicates that it was slipping, but we've actually resolved it now. So if I did smooth and it slips and I do roughened, and it slips a little bit less, and then I go serrated and it looks a different shape again, and I can see the serrated was necessary. If roughened and serrated had the same shape, then I could say, hey, I can just get away with roughened plates here. I don't need the serrated, actually, because they're very, very rough. So there's a few different types of cartridges. <clears throat> the first one is the plate cartridge. So these are modular. You can just pull them in and out. They're great. Plug and play. And then when you plug it in, it actually recognizes what it is. So um, on the front of the instrument, you can turn this handle 180 degrees and it will eject the cartridge, disconnects all of the liquids and all the power, and um, you just pull it out. If you want to put a different one in, you just put it in, turn the handle 180 degrees and it inserts it, and it immediately hooks up all the connections. So these are really useful. And um, if you slide this upper lock to the left, or this is the newer design, you slide this to the left, this releases the lower plate. So you can see somebody holding a lower plate. If you want to switch it for a smooth one, or a roughened or serrated, or a different diameter, or a different type of measuring system altogether, you can just switch them out like that. So you have a temperature range again with the active hood, minus 40 to 200. To get to minus 40, you need a chiller bath, but minus 10 without a chiller bath even. So this is the same as the uh, plate system, but obviously has a hood on the top. So this heats from the top and from the bottom, and it was a zero heat flux design. So <clears throat> the idea is that the geometry shaft gets heated up as well as the sample from the bottom, and then the, there's zero heat flux in and out of the sample, and it should get to great thermal equilibrium in no time. So these are really good for samples where temperature sensitivity is um, is a critical factor. Maybe you're working near the melting point of a sample, or you know that the sample is oil-based or asphalt, and so getting the right temperature really is important here. And um, 
we can obviously open these hoods and then we can see right in to trim the sample or load a new one. There's also a purge gas inlet, so you can purge it with nitrogen if you want to. And then there's a Peltier cylinder for cup and bob type work. <clears throat> um, you can put different size cups into this. So this is a C25 cup. The largest one we have in there is a C34, which is actually a 37 millimeter cup and a 34 millimeter bob. So these are named after the bob size. And the cup is actually 1.1 times the bob size. So C25 has a cup 27 and a half millimeters in diameter. C14 has a cup 15.4 millimeters in diameter. And um, <clears throat> so you can have different sizes here. Now also, this goes from minus 30 to 200, so not quite so low on the low end. You'd obviously get to the low end here by a chiller bath as well added in. Otherwise, you can go to minus five, I think that the spec says, minus five up to 200 degrees C. Um, <clears throat> you can switch these cups out easily. You just slide the lock to the left and take it out to so wash it, clean it. And um, <clears throat> the lower plate also will accommodate a plate insert. So if you want to use mostly cup and bob geometries, but occasionally you think you might need to use cone and plate or something like that, then you could buy the cup and bob peltier, the, cel the cylinder, and just slip this plate insert in whenever you want to use it. So that gives you a slightly narrower temperature range, but it's still very flexible and it saves somebody the money of having to buy a whole plate cartridge as well. So um, that's a good option for the low budget buyer. Okay, so, Generally, the uh, choice of a measuring system is determined by the viscosity. So if it's water-like, you need a larger surface. So think of things larger than 40 millimeters in diameter, usually, ideally. If it's a thicker liquid, but free-flowing, so think of things like um, half and half, or pouring cream, or honey. So then a 40 millimeter plate would work, or hand cream, these sort of things. If it's a semi-solid or solid-like sample, like Play-Doh or putty, um, or a thicker adhesive, then you probably want to use a small plate, maybe even smaller than 25 millimeters. And um, if it's a viscometry test, then maybe a cone and plate, because that's going to give you a uniform shear across the whole surface. Um, if it's oscillation, then it doesn't really matter, because you're not actually shearing it round and round, you're only oscillating the sample, so you can use a parallel plate and um, and set the gap for your sample's needs. If you don't have any specific needs, then set it to one millimeter. So if you want to accommodate big particles, you could use a bigger gap if you like, say three millimeters. Or if you want to uh, get to a very small gap, then 0.5 millimeters. Um, yeah, if you wanted to say minimize the thermal gradient through the sample or something like that. So there's a lots of other criteria that you could use to define the, the measuring systems. Um, so for large particles, you, you may want to go for a cup and bob. So if somebody gives you a sandy um, ceramic suspension, cup and bob would probably be better because it could accommodate those big particles. For very low viscosity materials, you might want to go for that double gap cell, which has the most surface area. And if you have a sample that you think might slip, so uh, grease or hand sanitizer, those sort of things where the viscosity seems quite high. And then when you shear it, it gets very low all of a sudden. Then think of slip and you want to use something with a roughened or serrated plate surface. And um, <clears throat> you can obviously get to, uh, you can do viscometry with parallel plates if you want to get to the very high shear. Remember by using the narrow gap. If you want to accommodate big particles, then you can use a, then use a wider gap as well. So in summary, what we've covered today is which geometries we have and um, which cartridges we have. And in the next section, we're going to have a quick look at instrument overview and some of the accessories. So thank you very much for your attention. And here's some uh, references if you'd like to look up some more about rheology. And I'll See you soon, hopefully in Module C. So Module C, this is uh, an overview of the accessories, continuing on our introduction to rheology and rheological testing.
My name is Philip Rolf, I'm one of the specialists here in the USA. So in this section, we're going to um, have a brief overview of the Conexus, examples of different geometries. We're going to look at inserting and swapping the cartridges and um, a quick overview of the different types <clears throat> and then some example results. So this should be fairly quick and we have a video. This is Shona, um, who is our marketing manager now in the, in the UK office. And she's going to show us some some of these accessories. Let's see if this runs, hopefully. So Shona's taken out the plate. She's showing in the top of the shaft there, there's an RFID. So when she clips it into the instrument, it immediately recognizes that she's attached a parallel plate 40, and it's asking her to zero the gap. So this is really a differentiating factor between Netch's Connexus and some of the other instruments out there which don't. Um, make this quite so simple. You see there's a wide range of diameters. She just showed you a 60 millimeter plate and an eight millimeter plate. And then there's some different surfaces. So this is a serrated one. On the left, this is a <clears throat> 600 micron deep serrations. And then this is a sandblasted or roughened plate, which is, they're both the same diameter, 40 millimeters. And these are the samples that would slip. So if you want to remove that lower plate, you slide that lock to the left and you can see that it comes right off. It's got three feet to hold it down and there's a recess into that lower plate which accommodates a PT100 temperature sensor. So that's actually measuring right below the center of the sample and it's gonna give you a pretty accurate temperature reading on the sample during the test. So to take the geometry out, you see she just pushed up on the upper chuck and it dropped right out. So it's, a, it's kind of a plug and play. Now the lower cartridge has come out here, she's showing you a cup and bob. The, the bottom of that cup comes off, it's unscrewable, there's a little plastic cap on there, and she's inserting it, she's turning 180 degrees, and that would have immediately recognized what she plugged in. This is a stainless steel cup and bob, it's a C25, and you see it was a roughened one. And now she's gonna slide that into the lower cup and lock it into position. And um, and then this is a vein tool. This is a V25 vein tool with a long blade type. So you could test, um, as I say, bentonite gels or samples that you want to let set in your cup for a long time. So that, oh, here's the hooded, hooded uh, plate cartridge. So these hoods open up. So that would heat from the top and the bottom and uh, give you zero heat flux across the sample. So that's a great temperature controller for temperature sensitive materials. And this is our solvent trap cover. So this one is going to um, cover the sample up. So you'd actually put an annulus over the geometry. This is the reservoir ring. So you see that she's showing you that now, that's the reservoir ring and you slide that over the measuring system and you'd put some water in there or whatever you think is the most volatile solvent and attach that on the rheometer and then you'd put um, the covers over it to dip into that. And there's also a purge gas inlet on this uh, solvent trap cover so you can use it as a purge gas system as well if you like. You'd purge the gas in through these little uh, openings on the side. Okay, so that's a, a quick look at uh, the instrument. And some of the accessories, there's a wide range of them. We won't go through every one of them, but at a glance, you can see we have UV curing. So these are great for um, setting samples, torsional fixtures. This is for solid materials or composites even, or ceramics. You can clamp a sample top and bottom. This is our solvent trap, which we'll look at in a minute. Universal container holder, so you can clamp a beaker or even if you open it to the wider settings, you can adjust it quite well open and then you can open a gallon of paint in there or something. You've got texture analysis tools for penetration. There's a hemisphere and a couple of cones to an orbital ball. A denoy ring for measuring surface tension. A bicone, which would be measuring between an oil water interface, something two immiscible fluids to see if there's an areology at the interface. Disposable plates are great for things that have cured. 
you can throw them away. They're about $5 a pair. Dispersion accessories. There's a spirally groove bob and starch paddle for mixing up powder and liquids and things. Crumb rubber kit. A Mooney Ewart cell. This has a very uniform shear across the whole surface and it only has a small volume. So that's quite good if you want to apply a known shear to a sample and then look at it in some other method. Tribology is the resistance to, to flow as in friction, frictional behavior. We have a rear microscopy cell where you look up from underneath. It's almost like UV curing, but you actually put a microscope underneath and you can look at the sample structure before, during and after shear, which is great because you can see emulsions that might be ripening with temperature or you can shear them quickly and see if they've broken down into smaller particle size. With an immersion cell and uh, for keeping a sample completely immersed while testing, mobilization cell for dewatering samples as you test them, three point bending for semi solids or solids, and then a fiber film fixture for pulling off um, thin fibers to check their tensile strength. So the solvent trap, this is uh, very useful and people use this a lot. There's two different types actually, and this one's called the passive solvent trap. <clears throat> which is a bit bigger and it has a double frame shell here. So there's a stainless steel insert and then there's um, a black peak or Delrin outer. And this is for thermal insulation. This first one here is for, for the actual solvent. It dips into the reservoir. So if your sample is volatile, you put whatever you think is going to evaporate into this reservoir and then you put these two semicircular halves in and this will make together and make a completely closed atmosphere here. So your sample will evaporate the first 15 or 30 seconds, but then it's going to get a saturated atmosphere and then it won't evaporate any longer. And then you should be able to make tests for hours and hours without any drying. Um, now, when you put this thing together, it's hard to know whether it's touching the reservoir. You know, you put the cap on here and it may be touching the reservoir. So we have this zeroing tool where you, you push this in and it actually reduce, lowers the reservoir to the right height. So that's, that's why this, uh, this is a spacer tool that you push down and you take out, but that's just when you're setting it up. So you can see um, the effect of using a solvent trap. This is tomato ketchup over many hours here, 20 hours. And you can see without a solvent trap, it dries out. Anytime you see the viscosity continuums go up and up and up for hours, that's a pretty good sign that your sample is probably drying. But if you put a solvent trap on it, actually you can see it's not drying. It's just rebuilding a little bit, but then it eventually just plateaus. So um, <clears throat> rebuilding from when we loaded it, because loading the sample onto the instrument maybe broke some of the structure. <clears throat> so the solvent trap is pretty useful. And you can use that with cups and bobs as well as with plates or cones. Now, sometimes sample degradation is a bit of an issue. And um, if you know that you're measuring polymer melts at high temperature, they can tend to oxidize. And so it's a good idea to try to purge that hood with nitrogen. So we have here um, the purge inlet. Actually, I don't know if you can see it in this picture, but um, you, would, you would use the uh, inlet nipples on the side of that cover to to purge with nitrogen gas. This is a needle valve, and maybe you supply it with one bar of nitrogen, and then you can purge it very slowly with just a trickle of nitrogen through. So you don't really want it to cool the sample down. You only want it to be a positive atmosphere so that it expels air rather than allowing moisture in. Um, this is the UV curing cell. So again, using a Peltier cylinder, we're going to take a cup out, we're going to put this plate insert in, but this plate is actually quartz. So we have two types actually, quartz or borosilicate glass. Uh, borosilicate glass being a little bit less expensive, but not having quite the same bandpass width for UV. And then we can make an oscillation test and we can see the sample initially is quite low viscosity, maybe um, an epoxy or something. And then we apply UV to it. You see the light coming on here the intensity is being recorded in blue and then after 30 seconds it's being turned off again you can see the curing is immediately starting so um, you can see three different sample thicknesses this is the thinnest sample obviously it cures most completely 
and then a very thick sample obviously takes a while for the sample to to cure depending on how, how opaque it is um, so we supply the whole thing if people want or we can supply just the um, <clears throat> the optics if people want to supply their own uv light source that's an omnicure s2000 light source this is a torsional fixture and it also fits inside the Peltier cylinder. This Peltier cylinder is a jack of all trades. It can do lots of different things. So if you um, don't put a cup in there, but rather clamp the sample in these fixtures, there's a jig so you can lay it out on the side, clamp the sample in there and clamp it top and bottom. You measure the open length, the thickness and the width, and then you put the cover over that the, um, the outer wall of the cylinder on and screw it in. And then you put the whole thing into the cylinder, clamp it in place, and then attach the top. So this comes apart the top with a couple of Allen keys and you attach it to the instrument. And then in the software, you need to tell it the dimensions of the sample that you put in there. But you can make a torsional measurement on really solid samples. You could test glass or, or ceramics or any solid material you like, or um, asphalt aggregates and things like that, uh, cores of sample roads. Um, obviously we can do a temperature ramp if we're slow about this and um, as we warm it up we could see glass transitions so this is really analogous to dma we can see here the elastic modulus dropping off the viscous modulus increasing and then dropping off and then this is our tg the peak of tan delta shows you the glass transition temperature which looks like it's about 160 degrees c in this case this is the universal container holder um, so we can put a beaker on there. This is nice for uh, people that want to test the sample in its own Petri dish, maybe if they're doing longer studies, put the sample straight in and out of an incubator. So you can uh, close and open this to wider gaps and clamp the sample, uh, the beaker rather, or the container. Or if you take the um, these Allen key screws out, then you can actually fix the texture analysis accessories and then you could put a dog biscuit across the top or something like that and check the, um, the testing of it. We've got some penetrometers here. There's a cone and a, a narrow angle cone for especially hard samples or a hemisphere for brittle hardness. Um, so this is um, testing chocolate cookies. These are uh, Cadbury's, I think. And um, there are two different types. One is double coated it's got white chocolate and uh, brown chocolate and then this is just regular chocolate you can see this one's a little bit weaker and this is the um this the double coated is a little bit stiffer so we're going to bring down a um a crossbar across this penetration across this uh, texture analysis accessory to try to break it so shona did this test um a few years back and she actually took some cookies here and dips them into a cup of tea and then put them across here and then brought the head down at set speed. And you can see the effect of a stale cookie. It's obviously quite stiff, but soft. Uh, so not brittle rather, it's more stiff, but um, chewy. We've got a fresh cookie, which is a little bit less firm, but snaps cleanly, so that's nice. And then the dunked one, obviously that's gonna be much softer so the dunked one there in green. Um, now this is this is important actually for a lot of cookie manufacturers because they didn't want people to be able to put their cookie in there and the thing fall apart. I don't know if you uh, do this, but it's a very common thing in England that people dip their cookies in their tea and you don't want that uh, cookie to fall in half and be floating around in your tea. So quite a lot of different accessories and um, it makes the rheology testing a very interesting and exciting field because we can test so many different sample types. And um, it's pretty um, intuitive how it's gonna work. You just choose the right geometry and, um, and then obviously you can, you can get the right rheology if you do that. Obviously you can call us for help at any time and uh, we'll be here to help you test samples or to find the right measuring systems for your tests. So thank you very much for your attention today, those three modules, and um, I uh, look forward to working with you soon. Thanks very much.